All right, here we go with Romans chapter 2, finishing the chapter this morning. We know that Paul, the apostle, has been writing to deal with issues that are faced by men and women all over the earth because everybody seems to be aiming for something in life to make them happy, and most of them are preparing for a life that's yet to come. Uh, the majority of the world over is religious or is spiritual in some sense, and much of it, the majority of that, is wrong. The Apostle Paul has just as much bravery as you need here to do everything he can to dismantle uh, in men and women all over the place any sense of false spiritual security. And there's a lot of that all over the world, always has been. People putting their hope in something that will not suffice, aiming for a target that they cannot hit, they are looking for salvation in all the wrong places. And the Apostle Paul has been categorically dismantling false senses of security in specific groups. He's dealt with two so far. This morning is the third. The first group were those who decided to believe whatever they want about God, change the truth about God entirely, or to just not believe in God at all. People like that suppose that it will go well for them in the end, Paul tells us otherwise. He says it didn't work in the ancients, it didn't work for those who have lived before us, it's not going to work for us now, us Northlanders. It's not going to work. Believing something that's untrue about God isn't going to change what's true about God. So you don't have to believe, but it's not going to change anything. The second category in which all men and women fit I mean, one of three, one of three. Either we change the truth about God or we don't believe in him, thinking that our beliefs are going to somehow change our destiny, which it doesn't. The second category into which some fall are those that are moral. They're good people, or so they think. They think that by comparing themselves to other people who aren't so good. Uh, the moralist here is those whose spiritual confidence is built on being better than other people. And yet they're just as detached from God as those in the first group were, though they wouldn't recognize that. And the reason is, is because they rely heavily upon their own morality and their own goodness to exonerate themselves from the penalty of sin. Now, at this point in Paul's discourse, almost any Jew would have wholeheartedly agreed with everything that he has written so far. Yes, those godless pagans, they deserve what they got coming. Oh, yes, those moral people who don't know the scriptures, they got it coming. And I, I tell you this because um, Paul is targeting the Jews, but that's not my goal this morning. My goal is to target a group that is very much like the Jews of his day, and that's the Christians of my day. See, because I think that for all of us in this room, generally speaking, there may be a few exceptions, but for the most part, we wholeheartedly agree with what Paul has said so far. Yeah, you can't live a life of sin and expect to go to heaven. Yeah, you need more than morals, and we all know what we need, and we know the answers to that, okay? We know that we're saved by Jesus, not works, and so we add that to our own credit. And we also know that if we're really saved by Jesus, that works will follow, because we got good theology here. And we know that people who don't do good works just don't love Jesus enough. And if they would really cultivate a relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship, a love relationship, then they would have works to prove their salvation. And we know that hell is real, and we know that heaven is for us. And that there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who memorize that verse. And we know the words to amazing grace. And we know the words to 10,000 reasons. And we know a bunch of other words to a bunch of other Hillsong songs. Okay? <laughs> and we know we're right. Right? We're right. There are some 4,300 religions of the world, and only one of them is right. Ours. Ours. And of the countless versions of ours, 
We have the right version of the right religion. We're right. We know this because the Bible says, John 14, 6, Jesus said, no one gets to God but through me. Acts 4, 12, salvation is in Christ, nowhere else. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, there is only one God and Jesus Christ is the only one who can bring us to him. We got it. We're right. We have the answer. Everybody else should want what we've got. Everybody else should come to us for the truth. Everybody else's life should be illuminated by the light that we emanate as Christians of the right religion and the right denomination and the right local church and the right orthodoxy. Here's the trouble. You ready for some trouble? You knew there would be trouble, right? You can't read the Apostle Paul's writings and go, oh, okay. No, no. Of the 2.5 billion Christians, and you know that there are, what, 8 billion people? Dude, that's a lot. There's a lot of Christians. 2.5 billion? And of them, they're not all saved. They're not all saved. So, so apparently, you can be right and still wrong. And that happens a lot, ladies and gentlemen. You can be right and still very, very wrong. And that brings us then to the third group. The third group. We're not godless pagans here. And we got more than morals going for us. We're right. Okay, but not all of the 2.5 billion have it right. Who is this third group? This third group are those who have false hope in their religious association to save them. They have false hope in the fact that they're Christianity. They, they, they are Christians. They have false hope that they are of this religion, their religion or their denominational affiliation or their local church or anything else that's connected to it is enough and that makes us right and that makes us deserving of heaven and that makes us favorable to God. Paul begins in verse 17 and says, Indeed, you are called a Jew. Yeah. Good for you. Now, I want you to notice this as we go through our passage this morning. A lot of what Paul says to the Jews is interchangeable with what could be said today of the Christians. Indeed, you're called a Christian. Okay, well, what? Well, hey, We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You say you're a Christian, all right, you got that going for you, and you rest on the law, right? You got a Bible. You, you put your stock in the Bible because you're biblical and missional and radical. Okay. So, so you call, you call a Jew, and you rest on the law, and you make your boast in God. All of those are good things. All of those are good things, and in Paul's day, right things. The Jews were and still are, last time I checked, the people of God. Now he's opened the floodgates to anybody who by faith in Christ wants to become a child of God, wants to be in the family. But truly, in a strict sense, the Jews are the people of God. He hasn't written them off. He still has plans. They're right about this. Yes, they're called Jews and they rest on the law. They did. And they made their boast in God. Here's the problem. He says, you're, you call yourself, you're, you you're called a Jew, you're called a Christian. The problem with that is they were taking solace in what they were called, in their identity or their affiliation, and particularly their racial affiliation, the family they were born into. So these guys were identified as part of a group, listen, as part of a group that held a long-standing assumption that they were collectively favored by God. I'm a Jew. I'm in. You know what Christians do today? They also find themselves as identified as Christians, part of a group that has held a long-standing assumption in this country and worldwide that, they, that we are collectively favored by God. Does God love Christians? Yes. Of course he does. Are Christians saved by faith? Yes. Does that mean then that any old unbeliever can then call themselves a Christian, attach themselves to some Christian uh, organization, and sort of affiliate themselves with those who call themselves Christians, and then thereby be safe? 
Of course not. No more safe than anybody is by being born a Hebrew into a Jewish family. See, they held the belief that what, to be a Jew was to be spiritually safe. That was never any truer for the Jew back then than it is for the Christian now. Okay, you call yourself a Christian. Great. Is that it? Religious affiliation is all you got? We're going to go before God and say, of the 4,300 religions that we had to choose from, I got the right one, so you have to let me in. I'm a Christian. doesn't work like that way because I'll tell you this. You're, na you're neither saved by your religion nor are you condemned by your religion. You aren't saved for your religious affiliation. You're not condemned for your religious affiliation. It has nothing to do with religious affiliation. Even a Muslim, even a Buddhist, even an atheist can find salvation by faith in Christ and skirt the whole religious system. And even a Christian is going to go to hell if they don't. Okay? Because it never had anything to do with what religion you decided to pick. That's why it doesn't work for a religion to force their religion onto anybody else. So careful of doing that. Those of us who are Christians, we sometimes want to sort of push that on other people. You can't. Worst case scenario, you make yourself believe you did and you made them believe they were safe because they adopted your religion when really they have no faith in Christ. They're not safe and to do that, makes them twice the son of hell that you yourself already are. It's the same game the Jews played, and it's the same condemnation that Jesus pointed at them. You're called a Jew. You rest on the law. I mean, <laughs> these guys rested on the law. The law was the Old Testament scriptures. So these guys, like us, had access to God's written word. And the fact that they had ready access to God's written word only bolstered their false sense of security. They knew the scrolls, just like we know the Bible. They memorized the verses, just like we do. They studied it and studied it and studied it. Many people are condemned by the Bible. I would almost say that all people are condemned by the Bible. But listen to me, no one's ever been saved by their Bible. The Bible works to condemn you, but it cannot by itself save you. It's Christ who saves, not a Zondervan publication. Okay? Nor the right translation. People want to argue translations. Get over your arguments. Do you think you're going to be saved or condemned by what you choose off the bookshelf at Barnes & Noble? Because the answer is no, you won't. Did you know that God can save people apart from Scripture? I mean, it's really handy. I don't want to undercut the Bible here and go, you don't need it. No, you do need the Bible. Okay? We know what Romans 10 says, and we will. If we don't now, we'll know when we get there. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But don't bank on your Bible or knowing your Bible, studying your Bible, studying the biographies of those who studied their Bible. That's a cheap shortcut. You're saved by Christ. In John 5, Jesus rebuked his audience and said, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. <laughs> but those scriptures point to me. And yet you refuse to come to me to receive that life. So some people actually use their Bibles to conveniently avoid the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Apparently that's what's going on there. That we can so become so involved in the Scriptures and the dry and static Word of God that we end up eliminating from our lives the very one who could save us from the wrath of God. Lastly, he says, you boast in God. 
You're called a Jew, you rest on the law, and you boast in God. And Christians do that too. They boast because, well, I'm a Christian. They boast because, well, God likes me and God accepts me and I've got God. And, you know, I, I searched for him and I found him and, um, you know, I found God. And, yeah, you, you were either found or you're still lost. Nobody seeks after God. You don't find God. I found Christ. No, you didn't. Either he found you or you're still lost. But people make their boast in God both then and now, both in Ju Judaism and also in Christianity. And I'll tell you that uh, he's no more flattered uh, by people boasting in him now than he ever was. Especially when, like the Jews, they were only using him to boast in themselves. And a lot of Christians will do this. Jesus called us out on this. In Luke chapter 18, you don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you because I'm nice. <laughs> that was a joke. But it's not that I'm not nice. I just... Luke chapter 14, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised other people. So he's aiming at this category. Those who go, he says, two men went up to the temple to pray. So there they are in their holy house. This is like two people going to church, two people going to synagogue. He's targeting this group. He says, one of them was a Pharisee, the other one's a tax collector. They both went to the same church. One of them was a religious expert, a religious know-it-all. The other one, terrible sinner. Everybody in the community knew the guy and hated him. Okay? Two guys go to church. The one, the religious guy, he stood and prayed like this with himself. Jesus goes, the Pharisee stood there and prayed with himself. <laughs> Just here's a quick tip for those of you who pray. Pray to God, not to you. Yeah, yeah pray to God. You pray in a way where you beseech God, where you appeal to God, where you Praise God instead of yourself. Many people, their prayers are self-centered. Their prayers are self-focused. Their prayers are nothing more than a self-appeal. This man was one such prayer. He stood and prayed like this with himself. God, thank you so much that I am not like other men. Extortioners, you know. I read the paper and those guys are just like, what they're doing is so wrong unjust. My country is so corrupt, and, and all the politicians, and, and all the lawmakers, and, and all the people I work with, they're so horrible. I'm so glad I'm not like them. And adulterers, homewreckers, they don't love their kids, and they don't love their wives like they should. And, and I thank you, God, that I'm not like the tax collector. I'm not like the other people in this room. And here's what sets me apart. I fast twice a week. Yeah. Yeah, I occasionally starve myself. Because that makes me holy, and that makes me better than other people. And I tithe. I give tithes of all that I possess. He only tithes his money, if he even does that. But I give my time. When there's a retreat, I'm there. When there's a missions application, I'm on it. I'm so glad, God, that you didn't make me like those other losers. And Jesus goes, the tax collector, like the nasty guy, he stood afar off. He was afraid that he wasn't good enough to approach God. The other one was confident that he was. The other guy, the sinner, he second-guessed himself in his own standing before God. And yet something strangely attracted him to God because he knew he needed forgiveness, and he knew he wasn't who he should be. And he stood afar off and wouldn't so much as raise his eyes to heaven because he knew himself. Apparently, the Pharisee didn't. He thought he knew himself and was very wrong. This man actually did and knew that the Bible condemned him. And so instead of raising his eyes to heaven as if God approved or looking sideways at everybody else who's worse than him, he instead beat his chest and said, God, all I know I need is mercy. 
Amen. Jesus says, I'll tell you, that man went to his house justified, not the Pharisee. Because everyone, and that includes me and you, everyone who plays that game is going to be humbled in the end. Everyone who exalts themselves is going to be humbled. Whoever humbles himself, Jesus says, will be exalted. We boast so often in God when truly it's because we're proud of ourselves. Be careful of that. Be careful of calling yourself a Christian when you're not really a child of God. Be careful of resting on the law or trusting too much in your scriptures to do for you what cannot be done apart from Christ. Be careful of bragging to God about yourself instead of appealing to God on behalf of yourself. In verse 18, Paul writes, You know his will, and you approve things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. You know what God wants. You know the difference between right and wrong. You know the will of God. But knowing the will of God, simply knowing it and not doing it, that does you no good. We know this. We know what James says about this. Faith without works, it's dead. Knowing the Bible, knowing God's will without acting on it really backfires. If you don't intend to follow through with what you know, it only endangers you. That's why you, you need to be careful of how much exposure you allow yourself to have to the truth. To the truth. Every Sunday, every Wednesday that I stand behind this pulpit, let me, let me you know, I, I as best I can, unload as much truth as I possibly can in as clear terms as I can manage in order to either assist you to the greatest degree to follow Christ and have eternal reward, or if it's taken wrong, damn you. Do you understand that? The clearer the truth, the greater capacity it has to do one of those two things. If you, want to keep, if you want to keep safe, you need to go to a place where no attempt is made on clarity. No effort by, on behalf of the preacher to drive points home. No studying being done. No careful arrangement of how it's laid out. No attention being paid to the presentation. I'm doing everything I can to get you to heaven. Or... And this isn't on me now. Or to do the very opposite. I'd rather that not happen. I'd rather that not happen. But I have to believe that in some cases it will. Because it only exposes you to what the will of God is. And knowing it without falling through endangers you. Luke chapter 12 verse 47 says, The servant who knows what his master wants but doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely beaten. Not sure what that means, not sure what that'll look like, but severely beaten doesn't sound good, especially in comparison to the servant who didn't know his master's will. They'll be beaten too, but lightly. So apparently there's degrees of punishment based upon what you know concerning God's will. Head knowledge alone is dangerous, guys. A lot of people pursue good theology without relent. They study and they, they love the, the richness of what the Bible says and, and they love to study the classics, you know, Spurgeon and Calvin and Whitfield and whoever else. And really, good theology can have quite the reverse effect in some cases. Head knowledge alone, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8.1, puffs up puffs up. Knowledge puffs up. Okay? What that means is to inflate with pride. No outworking of what you're learning results in sort of, imagine a balloon getting pumped and pumped and pumped. The term means to be inflated with pride, an egotistical person that spews out arrogant thoughts. That's what good theology does to you when it's not mixed 
with good orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is what you know. Orthopraxy is how you use it. If studying the Bible only makes you proud, then the Bible's not doing its job, and it's not the Bible's fault. If studying the Bible only makes you proud, the Bible's not doing its job, and it's not the Bible's fault. He says, instructed out of the law. He says, you got that going for you. You've been instructed out of the law. The Greek word there uh, is, is catechized. Catechism. Um, it's a term that simply means to be taught through repetition. Taught through repetition. Oftentimes it takes place at a young age. Uh, parents will teach their children the scriptures. Timothy's mother did it for him. The Apostle Paul makes a remark about that in one of his letters to the young protege. He says, your mother from the beginning has taught you the scriptures and you know the truth and that's good. It worked well for Timothy. But to, to simply be taught repetitiously the truth of the word of God really doesn't in and of itself take care of the real issue. Those who come to church on a regular basis are catechized. You guys are catechized. That may be good. That may be bad. For some, it's nothing more than being taught through repetition to know the right Christian answer. And there's a lot of Christians that know the right Christian answer. Whether it's really believed or not, whether it's really making a difference in their life or not, uh, that's yet to be decided. But there's a lot of people that have been catechized. Uh, it doesn't really take very long for people to catch on what they should and shouldn't say at church uh, to uh, make themselves, keep themselves from looking like a fool. They, they learn the lingo quick. Oh, they don't believe that. I should, probably shouldn't talk like that. And, and so we learn how to talk. You can teach a parrot what to talk. I could, you know, go, go buy a macaw and teach them John 3.16 and I guess they're Christian too now. It's not how it works. We can't simply rely on catechism. Paul goes on and says, on top of all these things, verse 19, you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth and the law. And Paul says, you fancy yourselves to be four things, guides, lights, instructors, and teachers. He says, that's great, but in your case, it's dangerous. Dangerous for you, dangerous for your pupil, your student, the sucker who thought you were someone you're not. I'll tell you this. I see this play out over and over and over in the church. I see it with my own eyes when insecure religious people covet these titles. They want to be teachers, uh, instructor, guides, lights. You, we could call them mentors. We could call them tutors. They covet this position and these titles like bees covet nectar. There's something in them like a bee that needs to be the example that weaker Christians look up to and follow. Um, not because they intend to lead them down the path of humility they want to hold that position because it fuels their own conceit and their own insecurities. And there has to be something that can be done in order to quell my appetite. And ultimately, it's to become a tutor or a mentor. So they create opportunities for themselves because any church with discernment would never put them in that position. They create opportunities for themselves to win the affections of the naive because it's not hard to tell who's a naive spiritual person so that they can then become their mentor or their tutor. They need to hold that position. You watch them for just a while with a discerning eye, and you can see plainly that they won't make half the effort to fellowship with people who are more mature than they are than they will with people who are less spiritually mature than they are. Why? Because they're insecure. Nothing can make a spiritually insecure person feel better about themselves than to be needed by somebody else. Here's a newsflash. 1 John 2.27 says, they don't need you. 
1 John 2.27 says, they don't need me. Because 1 John 2.27 says that if they're Christian, they have the Holy Spirit. So they don't need to They don't need you or anybody else to teach them how to act like a Christian. That'd be bad for them. You're teaching them to be a parrot. Parrots can be taught to act like humans, but humans can be taught to act like parrots. Do this over and over and over until you get the knack, till it looks natural, sounds natural, feels natural. There, 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 you're a parrot. You're a Christian. And you belong to me because I did it. I accomplished that in you. I feel good about myself. I used to be insecure. Not anymore because I got you. You're my proof. You make me feel good. And that's the only reason I wanted to be your friend in the first place. If you could get to the bottom of a heart that takes that approach in the church, you would see they are not friendly people. They do not love you. They love themselves and will use you even if it means plunging you into the depths of eternal hell. They don't care. In verse 21, the Apostle Paul says, You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who say, save the planet, do you burn fossil fuels? You who say, save the whales, do you kill mosquitoes? Paul's trying to expose their hypocrisy. I used to run in a crowd that was very... Nature, natural, loving, hippie. I remember getting into an argument once with one of them about, I think it was George Bush was president at the time, and he wanted to drill in the uh, National uh, Arctic Wildlife Refuge. I don't know. It's like some gazillion square miles of unused land, and he was going to look for oil up there. And then there was a big hubbub among the well-to-do hippie community that, you know, the caribou up there were maybe going to be affected by a pipe. And uh, that's fine. I don't want to kill caribou unless I'm going to eat them. (sighs) But seriously, do you kill mosquitoes? I asked him that. I said, what's the difference? I mean, the value of an animal life. Okay, then, you want to go down that road? Those leather shoes? You hypocrite. And if they do drill up there, I expect that you will never buy gasoline again. You will sell your car and figure out how to go green. Green, green. I mean, you're, you're walking and you better get some different shoes. Because <laughs> people don't like it when they can't talk out of both sides of their mouth. And you know what Christianity does? It shuts people up so that you don't get to talk. Do you know that that vernacular is actually used in the scriptures? The Apostle Paul writes to one of the young pastors and says, Shut them up. Shut their mouths. Stop their mouths. Teach like this so that they have no argument. Back them into a corner. Help them to see their hypocrisy. And the Apostle Paul is doing that here for us. Do you see the hypocrisy? Do you steal? Do you commit adultery? A lot of these guys to whom Paul was writing would say, No. Because technically they didn't. I mean, were they? Yes, that's why Paul is saying it. But in their minds, they had so justified their own lifestyles to get away with what they knew was wrong that they would have said, no, we don't steal, we don't commit adultery. It's been noted that many of the Jewish men, even Pharisees on up, would actually go to pagan temples and take things out of pagan temples of value, idols. That's why Paul says, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Like you abhor idols, but you make money off of them. You say that drunkenness is sin, but you own a bar. Doesn't make any sense at all.
You who say don't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Again, they would say no. The catch was this. They might not have been committing adultery, but a lot of them were divorced. I found that divorce was very commonplace in ancient Israel, so that even the religious leaders were doing it. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 19 when one of them ran up to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, can a man divorce his wife for anything? Like, is it cool? Just any reason? You know why that was asked? Because Jewish men were divorcing their wives for any reason. You know why they were divorcing their wives for any reason? So that they wouldn't be guilty of committing adultery. They were sick of their wives. They wanted somebody else. So they would get rid of the one that they had by just turning in the paperwork. And then they'd be free in their own minds to go and chase whoever they wanted. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, Jesus dealt with the issue. This is in the Sermon on the Mount, so everybody's at church that day. And Jesus goes, by the way, I wanted to go down this road. You guys have a saying, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. As if that took care of the issue. So what was happening in their culture was that men were getting married, getting tired of the marriage, wanting a new wife, but knew how God felt about adultery. So instead of committing adultery, they wrote a certificate of divorce and then they were free to remarry somebody else, no questions asked. Jesus comes along and says, but I say to you, so he's going to give his perspective on the whole thing, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So these guys, in order to get themselves out of the situation, they literally pushed their wives into adultery so that they could free themselves of a marriage they didn't enjoy and still appear righteous to their peer group. Come out like the, the good guy. So from Jesus' perspective, men like that were making their wives commit adultery. He says, anyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. So she didn't need to commit adultery. You were going to force her to anyway by aborting the marriage. They had found a loophole to make their wives look bad instead of them. Paul says, don't do that. Do you do that? You would say adultery is wrong. But do you recognize the heart that would do that? You condemn adultery. Do you commit it yourself? You say that stealing is bad. Are you doing it? It's so easy to justify just a little bit of unjust um, I don't know how to put it. So, unjust acquisition. Theft. That's called theft. Call it what it is. Do you do that? He says, idolatry? Idolatry? We're going to preach against idolatry and pretend that we don't have a tendency? He says, you who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? He says, because the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. The name of God is blasphemed among the world because of how Christians live. You, take this personal, you are capable of painting such an ugly picture of God that the world will want nothing to do with him. We know that the converse is true. You are capable as a Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit, in love with Jesus Christ, capable of painting such a beautiful picture of God that the world wants what you have. But the opposite is also true. And in many cases, the world notices. You've all heard of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi holy man, he said, quote, I like your Christ, 
I don't like your Christians. He said, if it weren't for Christians, I'd be a Christian. There's a popular bumper sticker that you may have seen or a t-shirt. Jesus, save me from your followers. Granted, the world is always looking for an excuse to reject Christ, and if they have to, they'll use you, but don't let it be for good reason. They'll blame their unbelief on whoever they can. And in many cases, it's warranted. Everyone who claims Christianity is essentially telling the world that God endorses the kind of life they live. Anybody in this room who claims Christianity is telling the world that God endorses everything you do, the way you behave, the decisions you make. You give the world permission or you provide the world accountability. You either live in such a way that the world looks at it and says, I had better take things a little more seriously. Or, heck, I don't need to change nothing. They're doing all the same things I am. They watch the same movies. They go to the same places. They do the same things. It doesn't matter. The world blasphemes God because of us. What kind of a life do you live? Because I only see a couple hours a week. What kind of a life do you live? And if you think that it's not affecting anything because you can do it privately and keep it from being found out, you are absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. You know why you're so impotent spiritually as a Christian? Because God sees it and he won't give you power. So you commit secret sin and God gives you no power to overcome that sin because you don't want to overcome it. You spend your energy on keeping it secret rather than confronting it, confessing it, facing it head on and going to God like the tax collector, not the Pharisee, the tax collector going, God, help! If you live without any restraint, you make God look impotent. If you live before the world and claim to be a child of God, yet you carry on in public sin, you make God look like he's one who endorses that behavior. When you live in secret sin, as I've already touched on, so that he can't bless your life, like the Bible says he's going to, like Christians claim he will, but he can't do for you because of secret sin, you reveal him to the world as an uncaring, unloving, overbearing liar. The whole world knows that Christians claim to be blessed, so the whole world is watching you to see if you are. And if you're not, you make God look like a bad parent who won't bless his kid, who tortures them and mocks them and toys with them every day. You can have this, just kidding. You can have this, just kidding. The way we live either endorses the behavior of the world or convicts them of it. Matthew 5.16 says that we should so live that when people look at how we behave, they glorify him. Let your good works so shine before men that they glorify the God of heaven. Not blaspheme. They glorify him. Does your life glorify God? Or does it blaspheme God? Because it doesn't do neither. It's not neutral. It's one or the other. In verse 25, we get into circumcision because that's fun, right? There's all this Jewish terminology, and this was significant to them. To us, it's almost like, what? Circumcision? What is this all about? Um, this was their uh, physical, visible sort of badge of acceptance 
to God. We have our own. It's not necessarily circumcision, but it, we do have them. I'll get to that in a moment. But he says here, circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. You might as well never have done it. So apparently there's something in the Christian category that we have at our disposal that if we follow through with it, it's of benefit. But if, we, if it doesn't change the way we live, it's as good as if we had never done it. Okay? Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? Good point, Paul. Thank you. What do we got in the church that we bank on? Well, baptism and communion and confirmation and other things that are fairly um, they're not as strong here as other things. Here we have our own of course it's church membership it's uh, advancing in the ranks, joining a class, it's acquiring a service position uh, going on a missions trip uh, tithing uh, above tithing, giving to missions because that's, that's it right there you could fill in, replace the word circumcision with any one of those things, and it would read true. Uh, go back to verse 25. For baptism uh, is indeed profitable if you, if you keep the law, uh, but if you're a breaker of the law, baptism has become unbaptism. It, it did nothing for you if you still live independently of God's promises. Um, this passage, even though it doesn't use the word baptism, is probably one of the strongest arguments against baptismal regeneration in all of Scripture. Baptismal regeneration means that baptism is needed to be saved uh, and that you are regenerated or born again at the point of baptism. Some denominations and religions will do that at infancy uh, because they believe that it's necessary. This one really debunks that theory. Uh, in verse 27, will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code? I, I, you got to think of the thief on the cross. Did the thief on the cross have time at all to get down off the cross and get baptized or get circumcised if he wasn't, or, you know, do confirmation or take communion or get on a missions trip or like, can we just postpone the execution, please, officers? I got to do a few things to just make sure that I go to heaven. Jesus said, none of that's necessary. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So apparently his uncir uncircumcision or his unbaptism or, or his unconfirmation or his unmissions trip or his unchurch membership or his unwhatever turned into church membership and baptism and circumcision and all the things that were required of the law, expected of a Christian, all at the drop of a hat. Why? Because he had faith in Jesus at that point. Boy, you can be right and still wrong. You can be close and still so far away. And there are so many people who are just, they're aiming at heaven and they're aiming at faith and they're aiming at salvation and they're a millimeter off back here, but they're miles away by the time you get to the target. You know that if you aim at the moon, I'm going to shoot a rocket up there and it's just dead on and you look through the Hubble Space Telescope to make sure that you got it dead center. If you're a fraction of an inch off, by the time your rocket gets to the moon, you will have missed it by a galaxy. And that's the game people are playing in the Christian world. They're aiming for salvation, but without Christ, they're a millimeter off, two millimeters, maybe an inch or two, some of them a foot and a half. doesn't matter. Close doesn't count, you know, except for in horseshoes. Right? And hand grenades? Yeah, okay. So, so you want to get this right. We need dead-on accuracy, and that kind of accuracy can only be found in one location, and it's a person, and his name is Jesus, and he's very specific. You can't get him wrong. You got to read this. It's him and him alone, and the Bible is very, very clear on that. Verse 28 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is not a Christian who says that they are, who is doing all the things externally. They are not a Jew outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew 
who is one inwardly. He is a Christian who is one inwardly. And circumcision, if you want to go down that road, is that of the heart. Baptism is that of the heart. Communion takes place in the heart. Like, since when did you think that it had anything to do with a cracker and a little vial of grape juice? All these things that we do externally. You want to go on a missions trip? Deal with your heart. Nobody needs to be evangelized greater than you. Deal with you. And then you have something to offer somebody else. You want a service position? Serve the Lord from the heart. You want church membership? Get born again. You're in. You don't need my class. You don't need that little blue book. You know, you don't need to put up with me. Church membership is something that happens in the heart upon regeneration. Again, you can be so close and still so far away. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, not in the law, not in the pages of scripture, not memorizing. No, no, in the heart, in the spirit, whose, pra whose praise is not from men, but from God. Don't do with your life what you hope will look good in the eyes of the Christian community. Don't waste your energy and your time and your money and your life trying to impress us and fool us into believing that you're a Christian. Listen, if I don't believe you're a Christian, what do you care? If I believe you are a Christian, that doesn't help. Your approval comes from God. Your praise comes from, not men, but from God. I will not judge you. I don't have a great white throne in heaven. I don't have a bema seat. I don't, I don't, you know, like, damned, saved. It's, that's not my job. There's only one who does that, and that's God. That's why Paul concludes his argument this morning by reminding us that the outside of a person hmm, doesn't always match the inside of that person. And I tell you guys that if the only proof of Christianity you've got is external... You've got no proof at all. And the longer you carry on in the right religion with the wrong heart, the more guilt you compile before God and the harder you make it for yourself to ever break free from that perspective, from that paradigm, that religious chain to pursue Christ with your heart. Religion doesn't make you a better person. Religion never made anybody a better person. It only makes them better pretenders. If religion is all you've got, it won't make you a better person. Christ sanctifies you. It's the spirit that works in you, not your religion. That's external. Anybody can fake it. It doesn't make you a better person. It only makes you a better pretender. Religion alone doesn't keep you safe. In fact, if that's all you've got, it only exposes you to greater danger. You cannot protect yourself by deciding to call yourself a Christian or by reading your Bible enough and knowing the gospel, or by catechizing yourself by regular church attendance to all the church lingo so that you turn yourself into a feathered friend. You can't protect yourself by becoming a theological expert, teacher, instructor, guide, light, none of that. Just because a doctor is a doctor doesn't mean he can't still get cancer. There is no position high enough in the medical field to protect you from a heart attack. There is no position high enough in the church to protect you from hell. And how many Christians have a faith that goes no further than what their church requires of them for membership? How many Christians have a faith that goes no further than whatever it was that their church expected of them for membership or a hope that goes no higher than the hope that they have in their own religious achievements or a love that lasts no longer than what's expected of them on Sunday morning? You may have heard this one. It bears repeating. Coming to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. If you're expecting God to radically change you because of who or what you're affiliated with, you'll be waiting forever. You will never change. 4,300 religions in the world each claim to be the most accurate in shooting the moon. Shooting the moon 
is an idiom, a phrase, a saying that means to set your goal very high despite the fact that the chances of achieving that goal may not be very good. Getting to heaven is possible. Being forgiven of sin, entirely forgiven, absolved of all guilt, it's possible. Religion just doesn't have what it takes to do it. Not even Christianity. <laughs> Only Jesus does. Only Jesus does. Ephesians 4.10 Jesus is the one who ascended higher than all heavens so that we might, so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. You want to go to heaven? You follow Christ. Not the dictates of your religion. Not the expectations of your local church. You faithfully follow Jesus Christ as he communicates to you his will through the Holy Spirit. Jesus has gone to heaven. He knows how to get us there. Hebrews 9.24 says he entered heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And a few chapters prior, he said, Therefore, since Jesus ascended into heaven, let's hold firmly to the faith that we profess. He's there. He knows how to get us there. In John 14, Jesus was about to depart from this earth, and he said to his disciples, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. There's more than enough room for you in heaven. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? He says, you know the way to where I am going. You know. And then Thomas pipes up, if you remember that guy. Wait, 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 he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus goes, I am the way. I am the way. It's not Judaism. And you know what Jesus would say to any doubting Thomases of 2021? Christianity isn't the way. I'm the way. Oh, you put such stock in your church membership and your missions trip and how much you have tithed and ah, all the things that you do and how good you are and all the things that you've acquired through Christianity that any old unbeliever could have acquired. It doesn't take faith to drop some money into a box doesn't take faith to get onto a plane and go to a different location and tell people what they should be doing with their life. The Pharisees were doing all of these things and more. Sinful things. And then pretending that they weren't. They were simply using their righteous things as a cover for the sinful things they were doing. Listen to me, guys. If any of you are doing that, it won't work. Religion can't cover sin. It cannot. Blood can, <laughs> but not religion. Atonement is a big deal word in the Bible. It means to cover. It's Christ's blood that covers your sin, not religion. We can't flatter God with Christianity. We can't flatter God with church attendance. We can't flatter God with any of the silly things that we do thinking that they will help. They don't. Now you want to talk reward. Oh, 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 yes, yes. If you want reward and you're already born again and you do have faith in Christ, then by all means, get on a plane and go serve the Lord in other locations and do that also in your backyard. And, and you might want to consider uh, supporting his mission financially. Yeah, oh, I know the pastors aren't supposed to talk about that, but sometimes they do because it's totally biblical. Oh, and, and also, you might want to think about reading your Bible and studying your Bible and having good theology so that you can purify your life with the truth of God. Just make sure that you're doing what you read and you're applying what you know. These things will work well for you, and there is great reward in heaven for those who follow Christ obediently. However, if religion's all you got, you're going to be disappointed in the end. You shoot the moon, you're probably going to hit some other planet out there. Don't even try. <laughs>